Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're just going to give another minute or two for our attendees to join, and we're going to be starting momentarily. Hello everyone and welcome to today's Model Aquatic Health Code Network webinar. My name is Daisy Galan. I'm a Senior Program Analyst at the National Association of County and City Health Officials, NATO, and together with my NATO colleagues, Emily D'Angelo in Lima, Missouri, we'll be moderating today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded and we will share along the presentation slides following today's event. Please feel free to um, interact with us via the uh, Q&A box and also submit your questions via the Q&A box as well. Um, we will address your questions at the end of this webinar. Um, for the purpose of this webinar, the chat function among the attendees is disabled, but you can also communicate with us via the chat box as well. Um, our first, in our next slide, we'll see uh, today's presenters. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Tessa Clements, who is a health scientist focused on drowning prevention in the Division of Injury Prevention at the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. Prior to this role, Dr. Clements led drowning data collection projects in Sub-Saharan Africa with the CDC Foundation. She has a PhD in injury epidemiology from York University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in global child health at the Hostel for the Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Clements. Our next speaker is Ashley Armon. Ashley is a senior health educator in the Drowning Prevention Program within the Community Health at the Florida Department of Health in Broward County, Florida. Prior to her role within the Department of Health, Ashley served our country as the United States Air Merit Support of Operations, Iraq and Enduring Freedom. During her service, she found her drive for serving through public and preventive health and obtained degrees in health science. Thank you so much for joining us, Ashley. In our next slide, we will see today's agenda for this webinar. We're gonna be begin with Dr. Tessa Clemens' presentation, sharing information on facts and statistics related to drowning and covering CDC's role in drowning prevention efforts. Ashley Armour will then provide an overview of the drowning prevention program at the Florida Department of Health in Broward County highlighting the students preventing unintentional drowning or SPUD program, which was recognized as a 2020 nature model practice. Following these presentations, we will then have time to answer any questions you submitted to our panelists. As a reminder, you may submit questions using our Q&A box at any point during today's webinar. So with this introduction, I will now pass the word to Dr. Tessa Clements for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about drowning prevention. Next slide, please. In this presentation, I'll cover key facts and statistics about drowning in the US, including the latest data on drowning, factors that put people at a higher risk of drowning, and prevention strategies. I'll also talk about racial and ethnic disparities in drowning rates in the US by presenting the findings from a recent CDC Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, or MMWR, on that topic. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about the work that CDC is doing in drowning prevention. Next slide, please. 
Before getting into the key facts and statistics, I'd like to review the internationally agreed definition of drowning, which is that drowning is the process of experiencing respiratory impairment from submersion or immersion in liquid. This means that not all drownings are fatal. Fatal drowning happens when the drowning results in death. Non-fatal drowning happens when a person survives a drowning incident with a range of outcomes, from no injuries to very serious injuries or permanent disability. Next slide, please. Drowning is a leading cause of death for children in the United States. More children ages one to four die from drowning than any other cause except birth defects. For children ages one to 14, drowning is the second leading cause of death after motor vehicle crashes. While children are at higher risk, anyone can drown. Every year in the United States are an average of 3,960 fatal drownings, including boating related drowning. That's an average of 11 drowning deaths per day. On top of that, there are an estimated 8,080 non-fatal drownings. This is an average of 22 non-fatal drownings per day. Non-fatal drowning can result in long-term health problems and costly hospital stays. For every child who dies from drowning, another eight receive emergency department care for non-fatal drowning. Non-fatal drowning can also result in more severe outcomes than other injuries. More than 40% of drownings treated in emergency departments require hospitalization or transfer for further care, compared to about 8% for all injuries. Next slide, please. Drowning death rates vary from state to state. The annual age-adjusted drowning death rates in the United States during 2015 to 2019 was 1 1.23 deaths per 100,000 people, including boating-related drowning deaths. This map shows annual age-adjusted death rates by state. The states with lighter shading have lower fatal drowning rates, and the states with darker shading have higher rates. Fatal drowning rates range from 0.65 per 100,000 to 4.97 per 100,000 population per year. The states with the highest drowning death rates were Alaska, Hawaii, Louisiana, Florida, and Mississippi. Next slide, please. The highest risk locations for drowning vary by age. Among infants under one year old, two thirds of all drownings occur in bathtubs. For children one to four, most drownings happen in home swimming pools. More than half of all fatal and non-fatal drownings among people 15 years and older occur in natural waters like lakes, rivers, and the ocean. Next slide, please. Some people have a higher risk of drowning. As I mentioned, children one to four years of age have the highest drowning rates. Males are another high-risk group. Nearly 80% of people who die from drowning are male. Many factors might contribute to higher rates of drowning among males, including increased exposure to water, risk-taking behaviors, and alcohol use. Some racial and ethnic groups have significantly higher rates of drowning than others, and I'll talk more about that later in this presentation. People with seizure disorders, such as epilepsy, are at a higher risk of fatal and non-fatal drowning than the general population. Drowning is the most common cause of injury death, with the bathtub being the most common site of drowning for people with seizure disorders. Some other medical conditions, such as heart conditions and autism, are also associated with a higher risk of drowning. Next slide, please. Certain factors make drowning more likely. This is not an exclusive list, but here are some of the key risk factors for drowning in the United States. Not being able to swim. Many adults and children in the U.S. report that they can't swim or that they are weak swimmers. Participation in formal swimming lessons can reduce the risk of drowning among children and adults. Another factor that increases risk is missing or ineffective fences around water. Barriers such as pool fencing prevent young children from gaining access to the pool area without caregivers' awareness. A four-sided isolation fence which separates the pool from the house and yard reduces a child's risk of drowning by 83% compared to three-sided property line fencing. Lack of close supervision. Drowning can happen quickly and quietly anywhere there is water, especially to unsupervised children. Drowning can happen anytime, including when children are not expected to be near water, and even in small amounts of water, such as in buckets and bathtubs. Not wearing life jackets is a well-established risk factor for drowning. 
Life jackets can prevent drowning during water activities, especially boating and swimming. The U.S. Coast Guard reported 613 boating-related deaths in 2019. 79% of these deaths were drowning-related, and of those who died from drowning, 86% were not wearing a life jacket. Drinking alcohol. Among adolescents and adults, alcohol use is involved in up to 70% of deaths associated with water recreation and about one in five reported boating deaths. Alcohol impairs balance, coordination, and judgment, and it increases risk-taking behaviors. Next slide, please. Some of the most effective drowning prevention strategies involve mitigating the risk factors I just described. Drowning can be prevented by learning basic swimming and water safety skills. Informal swimming lessons can lead to water competency, which means being able to anticipate, avoid, and survive common drowning situations, as well as recognizing and aiding those in need. It's important to note that children who have had swimming lessons still need close and constant supervision when in or around water. Proper fences, as I've mentioned, have also been demonstrated to be an effective drowning prevention strategy. Homeowners with pools should construct and use four-sided fencing that fully encloses the pool and separates it from the house and has self-closing, self-latching gates. CDC suggests that a responsible adult be designated to supervise closely and constantly when children are in or near water, including bathtubs. Adults watching kids in or near water should avoid distracting activities like reading, using the phone, and consuming alcohol or drugs because drowning happens quickly and quietly. Life jackets reduce the risk of drowning while boating for people of all ages and swimming abilities, and can also be used by children and weaker swimmers of all ages during non-boating activities when they're in or near the water. Air-filled or foam toys are not recommended to be relied on as these are not safety devices. Alcohol should be avoided before or during swimming, boating, and other water activities, and again, adults should not drink alcohol while supervising children. Next slide, please. Other drowning prevention strategies include learning CPR. CPR skills could save someone's life in the time it takes for paramedics to arrive. Many organizations offer CPR training courses, both online and in person. It's also important that people know the risks of natural waters. Lakes, rivers, and the ocean can have key hazards such as dangerous currents or waves, rocks or vegetation, and limited visibility. We recommend that people check the forecast before participating in activities in, on, or near water and adhere to all signage and flags at aquatic locations. Local weather conditions can change quickly and cause dangerous flash floods, strong winds, and thunderstorms with lightning strikes. CDC suggests swimming with a buddy and choosing swimming sites that have lifeguards when possible. The buddy system is especially beneficial for people with seizure disorders or other medical conditions that increase the risk of drowning. Individuals and families should be aware of and implement specific drowning prevention strategies for people with medical conditions, such as increased supervision around water, life jacket use, and for people with seizure disorders, taking showers should be considered rather than using a bathtub for bathing. Finally, we suggest that swimmers do not hyperventilate before swimming underwater or try to hold their breath for long periods of time. This can cause them to pass out and drown, which is sometimes called hypoxic blackout or shallow water blackout. Next slide, please. So that concludes a very brief overview of some key statistics, risk factors, and prevention strategies for drowning in the U.S. And now I'll spend some time presenting key findings from our recent MMWR on racial and ethnic disparities in drowning death rates. For background information, drowning death rates have decreased in recent decades. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Since 1990, drowning rates have declined by 57% worldwide, by 47% um, if we look at all high-income countries combined, and by 32% in the United States. Next slide, please. However, we know from a previous CDC study by Gilchrist and Parker in 2014 that there are significant racial and ethnic disparities in drowning rates in the US. The 2014 study found that during 1999 to 2010, 
non-Hispanic, American Indian, and Alaska Native persons had rates twice as high as non-Hispanic white persons. And non-Hispanic Black or African American persons had rates 1.4 times higher than non-Hispanic white persons. Disparities were greatest in swimming pools with Black children five to 19 years at highest risk. So our key question was whether the decreasing drowning death rates observed in the United States in recent decades have been accompanied by a decrease in racial and ethnic disparities. Next slide, please. We use National Vital Statistics System death certificate data from 1999 to 2019, so a 21 year period, to calculate drowning death rates and disparity rate ratios for persons aged 29 years and under in the United States. The reason we focused on people under 30 is because drowning is one of the three leading causes of unintentional injury death for each age group under 30 years of age. We calculated crude death rates for 100,000 population using US Census Bridge Race population estimates. Disparity rate ratios and their corresponding 95% confidence intervals were calculated using non-Hispanic white people as the reference population. And this was chosen because they represented the largest uh, racial or ethnic group during the study period. Rate ratios greater than one indicated a higher drowning death rate in a specified group compared to non-Hispanic white people. Conversely, rate ratios less than one indicated a lower drowning death rate in the specified group when compared to non-Hispanic white people. Drowning deaths were identified using the International Classification of Diseases 10th Revision Underlying Cause of Death Quotes W65 through W74, which are the traditional unintentional drowning codes, as well as B90 and B92, which are boating-related drowning codes. Death rates and rate ratios were examined by setting. So bathtubs, swimming pools, natural water, boating, and other or unspecified, as well as by age group and race and ethnicity. Race and ethnicity was categorized as non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native, non-Hispanic Asian or Pacific Islander, non-Hispanic Black or African American, non-Hispanic White, and Hispanic or Latino, which I'll refer to as Hispanic in this presentation. Age was categorized in five-year age groups, except for infants under the age of one. We use joint point regression to describe trends and changes in trends in annual death rates and rate ratios. Next slide, please. We found that during the study period, 1999 to 2019, a total of 34,000 315 people 29 years of age and younger fatally drowned in the United States. And racial and ethnic disparities did persist. Next slide, please. Because drowning fatality numbers can become quite small when we look at specific populations, there's a high interannual variability in drowning death rates. So we calculated five-year moving averages in rates and rate ratios to help visualize the trends over time. This chart shows the five-year moving average in drowning death rates by racial and ethnic group during the study period. The five-year moving average in crude drowning death rates overall decreased from 1.5 to 1.2 per 100,000 population per year during the study period. From 1999 to 2019, annual rates significantly decreased for each racial and ethnic group except for non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native people and Hispanic people. The highest annual drowning death rates occurred among non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native persons, ranging from 1.8 per 100,000 to 3.6 per 100,000 per year. And non-Hispanic Black persons, ranging from 1.6 to 2.5 per 100,000. Next slide, please. This chart shows the five-year moving average in disparity rate ratios by racial and ethnic group during the study period. Using non-Hispanic white persons as a reference, the five-year moving average in drowning rate ratio changed from 1.8 to 2.2 for non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native persons. Sorry, it ranged from 1.8 to 2.2 and from 1.3 to 1.6 for Black persons. 
There was no significant change in the non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native or non-Hispanic, Asian, or Pacific Islander to white rate ratios during the study period. Non-Hispanic Black to white rate ratios decreased significantly initially, but then increased significantly from 2005 to 2019. The Hispanic to non-Hispanic white rate ratio decreased significantly from 1999 to 2005, and then did not change significantly from 2015 to 2019. Overall, the drowning rate among non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native people was two times higher than for non-Hispanic white people. And the rate among non-Hispanic black people was 1.5 times higher than among non-Hispanic white people. So this is quite similar to the ratios that were reported in the 2014 study. Rates were lower among Hispanic persons and non-Hispanic Asian or Pacific Islander persons than non-Hispanic white people. This is overall. However, disparities were found in these groups for some ages and settings, which I'll talk about more on the next slide. Drowning death rates and rate ratios varied by age and setting. For all settings combined, disparities in non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native rates were present across all age groups. The highest rate ratios were among persons aged 25 to 29 years, with drowning rates 3.5 times higher in this age group, followed by children less than one. Disparities in fatal drowning rates between non-Hispanic Black and white persons were present across all the age groups except the one to four age group. And the largest disparities um, for non-Hispanic Black persons compared to non-Hispanic white persons were in children 10 to 14 years, where the rates were 3.6 times higher for Black children. And again, this is for all settings combined. On the next slide, looking at results by setting, racial and ethnic disparities were present in all settings and were most pronounced in swimming pool deaths. Compared with non-Hispanic white people, the highest rate ratios occurred among Black youth in swimming pools, where children aged 10 to 14 had rates 7.6 times higher than non-Hispanic white children. This was followed by 15 to 19 year olds, where the rates were 5.6 times higher, and five to nine year olds, where the rates were 4.4 times higher for Black children than non-Hispanic white children. Disparities in swimming pool death rates were also present in most age groups for non-Hispanic Asian or Pacific Islander persons and Hispanic persons. Among Asian or uh, among non-Hispanic Asian or Pacific Islanders, the highest rate ratios were observed among individuals 25 to 29, where rate rates were 3.2 times higher than non-Hispanic white persons. And among Hispanic people, it was 20 to 25, 20 to 24 year olds who had the highest pool drowning death rates. And these were 1.8 times higher than non-Hispanic white persons. In terms of natural water, fatal drowning rates were highest among non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native persons um, for all age groups with the highest rate ratios um, being found among older people. And the, um, the range was two to four. The drowning death rate in natural water among black persons was 1.6 times higher than among non-Hispanic white persons. And the highest rate ratio again was found in children 10 to 14 years of age. Next slide, please. So our study found that racial and ethnic disparities in unintentional drowning death rates among people 29 years of age and younger were evident in 1999 and persisted through 2019, with significantly higher rates among non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native people and Black people when compared with non-Hispanic white people. Although drowning death rates decreased overall, racial and ethnic disparities persisted during the 21-year period and the disparity between non-Hispanic Black and white people actually increased in recent years. As discussed earlier in this presentation, multiple factors contribute to increased risk of drowning for all people, including behavior, skill, environment, and underlying medical conditions. Racial and ethnic differences in drowning death rates might reflect variation in these or other social or cultural factors among groups. However, the information that's available from death certificates, which is the data source that we used for this study, is limited in our ability to explore these factors. 
So further research is needed on the determinants that contribute to these disparities, as well as what the barriers are to implementing effective drowning prevention programs in communities that are at the highest risk of drowning. I described a number of proven drowning prevention strategies earlier in the presentation, such as installing barriers, learning basic swimming and water safety skills, wearing life jackets, and so on. Racial and ethnic disparities in drowning deaths differed by setting, and the most applicable of these drowning prevention strategies might also differ by setting. However, having basic swimming and water safety skills can be beneficial in all settings. Previous research suggests that Black people report more limited swimming ability than members of other groups. Racial differences in fear of drowning have been identified as one factor contributing to limited swimming ability in some Black youth. A reduction in Black to white drowning disparities occurred in Florida from 1970 to 2015. This progress might be the result of community level initiatives to promote swimming skills among Black children. Swimming skill and other factors contributing to increased drowning risk in American Indian or Alaska Native persons has not been thoroughly explored. Engagement of the populations and communities that are highest risk of drowning is critical to developing effective programs and reducing disparities. Next slide, please. Key conclusions from this MMWR are that drowning is preventable and so more prevention efforts are needed to reduce racial and ethnic disparities in drowning death rates that persist in the United States. Identification and evaluation of factors that are driving the disparities will be crucial to inform the development and implementation of interventions that could effectively reduce them. Although the practicality of prevention strategies varies by setting, having basic swimming and water safety skills is applicable in all settings and engaging populations that are at the highest risk of drowning to understand and address barriers to accessing basic swimming and water safety skills training is needed. Next slide, please. I'll now briefly talk about CDC's recent and upcoming work in drowning prevention. CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control uses science to understand why injuries happen and the harm they cause and to develop successful solutions. The center works to save lives, prevent suffering, and help reduce healthcare costs. Next slide, please. CDC monitors drowning data and reports on trends and conducts research to understand drowning risk factors and promote prevention strategies. We also provide technical assistance to state and local health departments when requested and to a wide range of other partners through participation in Water Safety USA and the US National Water Safety Strategy as well as other drowning prevention related working groups. In the interest of time, I'll just highlight a few of our specific goals and partnerships. Next slide, please. A key goal of ours is to improve and promote drowning data and surveillance to better understand the circumstances related to drowning and estimate the burden of fatal and non-fatal drowning. In addition, in addition to monitoring existing data and providing facts and statistics like those I presented today, we are working to address data limitations and gaps. One thing we are currently working on is creating an updating, updated drowning definition for syndromic surveillance. Syndromic surveillance uses emergency department data and is very timely. So this may allow us to detect temporal and geographical surges in drowning in a more timely way than relying on traditional data sources. We're also partnering with the National Center for Child Fatality Review and Prevention on a new project that will work with child death review teams to improve data collection on the circumstances of child drowning. Next slide, please. Another goal of ours is to identify effective strategies for preventing drowning among all persons with an emphasis on underserved communities with the highest rates of drowning. To this end, we are partnering to pilot and evaluate programs to increase basic swimming and water safety skills among populations at higher risk of drowning due to racial and ethnic disparities. Over the past year, we worked with the National Network of Public Health Institutes and the American Red Cross on a survey to identify barriers to participation in basic swimming and water safety skills training in communities at increased risk of drowning as well as to pilot a basic swimming and water safety skills program for children one to four years of age. 
In the upcoming year, that pilot will be expanded to additional communities and will work to better understand the, effective, the most effective way to teach water competency skills to young children. We'll also be working with the YMCA to evaluate a program that teaches basic swimming and water safety skills to older children in communities at higher risk of drowning. Next slide, please. So in summary, drowning is preventable, yet is a leading cause of injuries and death in the United States. There are racial and ethnic disparities in drowning death rates that have persisted, and for some groups, increased in recent years. CDC is analyzing data and working with partners to understand the problem and find solutions. Next slide, please. Thank you. Additional drowning prevention information and resources are available on the CDC Drowning website, which is cdc.gov slash drowning. And you can reach me at tclemens at cdc.gov. I look forward to answering any questions at the end of the webinar, and I'll now turn it over to Ashley Armour for her presentation. Hello, my name is Ashley Armour. I'm the Senior Health Educator with the Drowning Prevention Program for the Florida Department of Health in Broward County. Next slide, please. Some drowning facts. Tessa did touch on the majority of these, um, but I do want to just, again, repeat that the United States loses approximately 4,000 people every year due to drowning. That equates for about 10 people per day. Next slide, please. Our drowning prevention program specifically. Our mission is to protect children from drowning, aquatic related fatalities and injuries by promoting safer water practices and strategic community-wide education to residents of Broward County. Our vision is to achieve and sustain zero drowning fatalities in Broward County. Next slide, please. Some of our goals. Number one is to increase public awareness of risk factors that can contribute to fatal and non-fatal drowning among children ages one to four. Analyzing available local drowning data to improve intervention programs. Integrate drowning prevention education into community-based organizations to reach and influence vulnerable populations create partnerships and provide training within the Broward County business community, encouraging them to educate and provide educational materials and resources to their customers. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to get into how we meet those goals. Number one, increasing public awareness of risk factors that can contribute to fatal and non-fatal drowning among children age one to four. We do provide educational presentations to pre-Ks and child care centers. So that reaches the group of one to four year olds. Educating on the utilization of Broward County resources, parent and caregiver trainings on common and unusual hazards and preventative measures. Next slide, please. Analyzing available local drowning data to improve intervention programs. We collect and analyze data sources via web, community meetings, and connections. We evaluate and disseminate data with our partners during Department of Health hosted Broward County Drowning Prevention Task Force meetings. These meetings we've created with partners throughout our community, first responders, um, our sheriff's office, firefighters, nurses, um, also um, pool safety leaders within our communities. We have schools that attend. Um, and also other uh, nonprofit water safety partners. Next slide, please. Meeting our goals, we integrate drowning prevention education into community-based organizations to reach and influence vulnerable populations. We, we utilize the train the trainer model to integrate prevention education to professionals and positions to influence target audiences. An example of this is that we have a standing relationship with DCF's ChildNet, where we provide training to their staff in order to better educate. And we also provide them with door alarms as a layer of water safety for their clients. Next slide, please. 
Number four, we create partnerships and provide training within the Broward County business community, encouraging them to educate and provide educational materials and resources to their customers. We have monthly Broward County Drowning Prevention Task Force meetings with community water safety leaders such as Water Smart Broward, public pool industry, our parks and rec departments, first responders, local YMCAs, our chambers of commerce, homeowners associations, and also the Early Learning Coalition. There's many more partners that we have that attend those task force meetings, but again, those are just examples. Information is shared. Task force members provide updates and new ways to educate the community are discussed. Next slide, please. Our SPUD Club. Next slide, please. Our SPUD Club is a phenomenal way to bring water safety education to high-risk communities and to create our next generation of swimmers, water safety ambassadors, and also parents by way of their children. We like to say that we're working from the ground up. Our SPUD Club vision is to introduce water safety education to middle and high school students while enhancing the leadership advancement and character development of our club members. Our mission is to promote the subject of water safety and drowning prevention by influencing classmates in the community throughout Broward County in hopes to improve the drowning issue here. Our description, Students Preventing Unintentional Drowning is a teen water safety ambassador club devoted to advocating on water safety. This club is designed to help address the awareness needs throughout Broward County and to allow for professional and leadership development among club members. Next slide, please. Here's how to implement a SPUG club in your community. So I posted a flyer here. We do have many incentives for our students. We provide them with high school service hours during their club meetings as well as for volunteering in the community at events that we host, health fairs in the community. Also, our students provide curriculum, they create and provide curriculum for pre-Ks and early child care centers themselves. We also give them certificates, graduation cords for seniors. We provide lifeguard scholarships and also free swimming lessons for our SPUD club students. So these are middle schoolers and high schoolers who are either non-swimmers or very weak sw swimmers who get a refresher training. They do get up to eight free swimming lessons at our local pools here in Broward County. And we like to say that they gain learning water safety and educating the community while enhancing leadership skills and character. They truly help make their school and their community more water safe, more water safe and more water smart. So steps to implementing a SPUD club are first, we schedule a meeting with the school administration. We present them with a SPUD folder. This has a SPUD recruitment letter, a SPUD, a SPUD work plan with sponsors and an agenda and curriculum breakdown that we do come up with. That does consist of water safety in general. We also go over um, not normal hazards, since there's water all around us in Broward County, as well as ocean safety. We confirm the meeting place and dates, and they confirm opportunities to recruit, either at open houses. We also attend high school sporting functions, if approved, to recruit for our students preventing unintentional drowning. Another route is through our swim teams and dive teams here in Broward County. Next slide, please. Some SPED evolution. You can see the growth from 2017 to 2018. We had eight clubs total, 100 plus club members with 15 meetings total for each club. This year, currently we have 15 SPED clubs. We have 400 plus club members with 15 meetings still for each club. That is our basic curriculum. We also added, since this year has um, been a lot with COVID, a mental health check-in day for our students, mid and end of the year parties with certificates, 
recognition and cords for our seniors. Next slide, please. Some highlights from our SPUD clubs. We do have icebreaker games that we play with our students. As you can see here in the pictures, they're building balloon towers and marshmallow and pasta towers. We not only want them to gain water safety education, but also life skills. So leadership skills as well. So we create these icebreaker games for them to interact amongst each other, to have an opportunity to lead at something and also feel like they're a part of something. Great, next slide, please. Outreach. As you can see here in the pictures, we have students that have outreach within their school. They put up tables, they hand out drowning prevention and water safety education materials. They hand out different types of um, tools, resources for the students within their schools, but they also volunteer within our community at health fairs, Department of Health events, outreach that we go to. They come out with tables and the education that they have learned from their SPUD club, and they provide that to the community. Next slide, please. Our field trips. Our field trips are a great way for our students, again, to utilize those leadership skills that we do want them to gain. They come up with their own water safety curriculum for their students who are one to four year olds in the Broward County community. We do attend a preschool, a local preschool or a daycare center that is close to their school, either in walking distance or we provide busing with one of our partners, WaterSmart Broward. We bus them to the schools. They provide their water safety curriculum to the students, typically in a station um, type of theme, type of setting. So they're passing on the information that they have learned and educating others in their community. We also provide the daycare center and pre-Ks with educational materials for their students to take home to their parents. Next slide. Thank you. In summary, for our Students Preventing Unintentional Drowning program, the goal for the SPUD program is to implement a club into each middle and high school in Broward County, and one day maybe even make it a statewide or national program. The SPUD program is something that drowning, our drowning prevention team and our community health team is very proud of. Thank you for the NATO model practice recognition. It is truly an honor to be recognized. Again, my name is Ashley Armour. I'm at the Florida Department of Health in Broward County in the Drowning Prevention Program. You can reach me at ashley.armour at floridahealth.gov with any further questions or maybe even some SPUD tips. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Clemens and Ashley for your presentation. We'll now move on to our Q&A portion of our webinar. As a reminder, please use our Q&A box to submit your questions for the panelists. And we'll now start with our quest first question that Emily will share with us. Hi, thank you. This first question is going to be for Tessa. Um, does the CDC have any drowning statistics by income level? Uh, so we don't at this time, but it's definitely something that we're interested in looking into. So hopefully uh, in the future, we'll be able to report um, by income level, um, but it's not something that we're, um, you know, have a current sort of product or paper on. Thank you so much. And I'd also just like to recognize that we're joined by uh, Joe Laco from CDC and then Renee Podolsky from uh, the Florida uh, Department of Health in Broward County to support the answering of any questions. Um, I'll turn it over to Daisy for our next question. Thank you, Emily. And um, Tess, I believe this next question may be for you as well. Is there any data that looks at urban 
versus suburban instances of drowning? So, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are some studies that have looked on this. Um, there's not a recent CDC study on the topic. And again, it's something that we're looking into. So um, just by, by way of a bit more context, I'll say that um, CDC has been tracking drowning data for a long time, but uh, has a bit of a renewed emphasis on drowning prevention over the last year. So the MMWR and our new drowning prevention website um, and the, the programs that I talked about today have all been launched within the last year. So um, it's very much a growing program and we have a lot of ideas and, and plans and we're sort of in the midst of strategic planning for um, further growing the drowning program at CDC moving forward. Um, but some of these items are um, sort of on the to-do list for, for the future. Thank you. Um, this next question is going to be for Ashley. Um, the question is, what is the budget for their for your excellent work at Broward County and what entities contribute to your budget? So we are funded by the Children's Services Council um, and our exact budget. Um, I don't have the number for that. I do see um, Tony Gomez. I'm going to just drop my email here. Feel free to email me and I will get those facts um, answered for you. Thank you, Ashley. No problem. Um, so our next question, and we'll get back to you, Tessa. Um, how did you get your data on non fatal drownings in the EG data? Uh, yeah, so the non fatal drowning data is emergency department data. Um, so this is um, it, it's estimates based on uh, emergency departments that the data is sampled from. And I think it's a good question because it allows me to um, also mention that we're aware that this doesn't necessarily capture all of the non-fatal drownings. So there's certainly non-fatal drownings that occur um, in pools or beaches or at beaches um, and other open water locations that where the person does not seek um, medical attention or um, is not seen in an emergency department. And so those non-fatal drownings may not be captured in uh, medical records that we can look at um, with emergency department and hospitalization data. And so um, the, the estimate of 8,080 non-fatal drownings per year is exclusively based on emergency department data and probably does not capture the true burden of non-fatal drowning, which would in, uh, include people who um, just went to primary care physicians or did not seek medical attention at all or were treated on the scene and didn't have any follow-up. Um, so that's an important distinction. Thank you, Tessa. Um, Ashley, this next question is who created this FUD program or what inspired Broward County to start this program? Um, and what activities do you have for the upcoming year? I know you touched a little bit about um, some of the parties and activities you have for the students, but. Yes. So um, actually, the Department of Health's Drowning Prevention Program created the SPUD Club Program. Um, also, the activities for this year that we have lined up, we do um, CPR training for our students. We also have a career day where, where we have um, first responders and members in our water safety community come in and speak to them about potential um, employment opportunities or um, things that they might be interested in in the future, uh, water safety driven. Um, we also have an end of the year party. This is where they get their awards and recognition. Um, and also we have our field trip lined up. Now we do all that in the second half of our um, curriculum. The first half is dedicated to water safety education. Again, I spoke a bit on that, um, but the first half is dedicated to um, general water safety, pool safety, um, and then the second half is dedicated to how to escape a sinking vehicle, um, also to ocean safety, because we are surrounded by water in Broward County. So we try to um, make sure that they are educated on um, hazards that aren't so common um, or that they would think about necessarily. Uh, but yes, SPUD Club was created by the Drowning Prevention Program at the Florida Department of Health. 
I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Tessa, I believe the next question is for you, but also maybe not if your, your team has not looked at this, maybe if you know other teams at, NHL, uh, at CDC are looking at, uh, have taken a look how systematic racism contributes to the consistent health disparity that we've seen between black, white, and Native American peers. So our group um, in drowning prevention hasn't yet. So this um, uh, MMWR that we just published was sort of a first step um, identifying that these disparities are persisting. And as I mentioned, um, the data source was exclusively death certificate data. So we get um, just basic information from that and not uh, much richness, richness on the circumstances that could help us understand really what the risk factors are and what's contributing to the deaths. Um, and so that's another step that we want to look at is trying to get more detailed circumstance information um, and then also looking at um, other um, factors such as systemic racism and so on. I, I'm, I know that a lot of groups across CDC are looking at health equity issues, um, but I don't want to speak to other programs efforts um, and looking at it through that lens specifically, um, but there's lots of information about different CDC programs on the website the CDC website. Thank you. Um, one, one other question that came in, in addition to the middle school and high school SPUD activities, and this question is for Ashley, uh, does Broward County have any plans to focus on efforts um, specifically for elementary school age children or preschool age children? Yes, we absolutely we absolutely do. Um, we already have um, some in place. Um, this fall, we have we do go out and provide presentations to our preschools and daycare centers locally. Uh, we have a full list in elementary schools as well. Um, and this fall, we're actually going to be having a few fall refresher water safety presentations because, as you can imagine, in South Florida, we are saturated with um, first responders and water safe, other members of the water safety community that um, are dedicated as well to our preschool aged and elementary aged children and getting them water safety education. But we do absolutely already have in place um, where we go out and we present water safety education, um, sp specific presentations for the pre-K and the elementary um, aged children. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. So Tess, I believe the next question is for you and it's related to some of the data that you prevented, that you presented, especially related to alcohol consumption. And if, do you know, we have someone here that has mentioned that their community struggles with getting proper attention paid to adult venues that promote alcohol consumption due to the lack of children. Uh, they don't consider the risk. So do you have any additional statistics to share or any additional resources? Yeah, so um, CDC does have um, data on all age groups. And so I focused on the um, children and, and youth and young adults in the presentation today because our recent MMWR was um, focused on people under 30 years of age. And again, because that's um, the, the leading, drowning is in the leading causes of unintentional injury death in those age groups. So, um, but we do have the data for other age groups. And um, uh, you can visit CDC Whiskers as a first start to look at drowning data and all injury data. Um, and I can drop the um, link to that in the chat in a, in a moment. Um, and also you can always reach out to us with specific data requests and um, we're happy to sort of advise um, based on what information we have and we can pull specific age groups and um, you know, state-based information, um, whatever would be helpful. Uh, this next question is for Ashley. Um, this person wants to know, through your work with SPUD, have you found that most of the students that participate in the program um, are doing so because they are maybe comfortable swimmers and um, 
you know, have positive experiences with the water or do you have an idea of how many students um, have little to no experience with water swimming? So that is a great question. Thank you for that question, actually. Um, where we actually like to um, go into the communities with higher rates of drownings. Um, so the high schoolers and middle schoolers that I'm usually interacting with, there's a very low rate of swimmers um, within my SPUD clubs. Um, they are motivated to join SPUD club for the free swimming lessons, which is definitely one of the major reasons why we're there. We do again have students um, that are motivated by positive swimming experiences. Of course, we have swim teams. Uh, we have swim coaches that reach out to us. They want to bring SPUD to their school, um, those kind of things. Um, kids that want to become lifeguards that can swim and maybe just want the lifeguard and um, the water survival training, those things. And we do provide scholarships to our SPUD club members that are interested. Um, but again, we do go into our higher risk communities so the majority of the students who are in SPUD Club, um, they are learning water safety and the importance of swimming and gaining swimming lessons, um, which is you know, a great thing again, because the majority of them are either weak swimmers or non-swimmers. That answers your question. Yes, definitely. And it looked like there were quite a few um, benefits for people that maybe don't have that experience or knowledge about swimming for them to join. Spoke club and take advantage of those uh, lessons and things like that. So thank you. So the next question is for Tessa, but also maybe for our other CDC colleagues uh, related to working with the YMCA. Um, I know Tessa, you mentioned the partnership with the YMCA nationally, where they want to see where they can find more information about that. Um, and I know we do have our CMAC program and you know we can also probably uh, make the connections for you David as well but want to open up to the panelists if they have anything else to add related to partner with the YMCA. Sure so the project that I was describing in the presentation um, is is a new uh, project that's just kicking off um, that's focused on evaluating a swim skills program um, so there's not a ton of information on it available yet, but if you reach out to me directly, I'm happy to connect you to our contacts um, at the YMCA so that you can get more information about possibly getting involved. Yeah, and CDC also regularly partners with the CMAC Council for the Model Aquatic Health Code, and uh, they've been uh, strong partners with our MAC network and have uh, presented quite a few times, and uh, we can get you in touch with Dewey as well. Feel free to reach out to directly to Tessa or myself or Emily or Daisy. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, and I think we have time for maybe just one more question. Um, and I'd like to open it up to both panelists. Um, this question is for those who've had positive swimming experiences, do you have any ideas for the motivators behind that? Um, parental influences or exposures, um, things like that. And I'll turn it over to Ashley to kick us off first with her. Um, typically it is they themselves that um, want to join uh, for the incentives. Like I said, again, we do provide seniors with cords. Um, they receive service hours. Um, also the opportunity to join free swimming lessons or have a lifeguard scholarship, even it's a great summer job here. Some of them are very influenced by that. Um, I do also have youth that their parents contact me for SPUD in their school. They've heard about it or they saw it and um, they were interested in it themselves, um, maybe even to gain their um, middle school or high school age children, water safety skills, or even free swimming lessons at that point. Um, we do have other resources through Water Smart Broward where we provide um, a swimming voucher for children now age one to eight. Um, or six months to eight years old, I'm sorry. And um, so for them to miss that and, and some of them finances being an issue as well um, for swimming lessons, it's also an incentive for their parents to even gain, you know, get their kids swimming lessons at that point. So some of them absolutely are influenced by their parents as well. Thank you for that question. Yeah, of course. And I'll let Tessa respond. 
I'll just add that one of our projects um, that we've been working on with the National Network for Public Health Institutes and uh, American Red Cross that surveyed um, a, a variety of uh, parents and youth, um, as well as aquatics providers, um, asked about facilitators for getting people into swimming lessons and what motivates kids to join, what motivates parents to enroll them. Um, and so we're just in the process of analyzing that data to be able to report out on it. So hopefully we'll have um, some, some more answers to the question, although I think Ashley's answer was uh, excellent, but we'll be able to um, add to that uh, in the coming months as we get that report out. Thanks. So I would like to say a big thank you to our both of our panelists for today's presentation and for answering all our questions. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, there will be a survey at the end of this webinar when you close out. So please feel free to complete the survey. Uh, your response will be very informative to all of us. And also we will be sharing uh, the webinar materials uh, with you after today's webinar, the recording, the slides. But if you have any additional questions, you're welcome to reach out to our team here at NATO at Mac, Matt, and nature.org. And we'll be happy to forward your questions to our panelists as well. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And this concludes today's webinar. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>